Uh, welcome everyone uh, here and there uh, to the presentation uh, today. It's a little bit uh, different for me sitting down, so I'll probably be moving around. I'm used to wandering around and get out, getting out of the camera's view and all those kinds of things. So uh, I always start the present travel presentations with uh, this slide uh, because our son once asked us several years ago, what do you mean bucket list? What, is, what in the heck does that mean? And so we tried to explain it to him. And about a hundred countries later now, uh, he finally gets it because our bucket list almost always has to do with travel. Next slide, please. Uh, there's our motto. We have that on some business cards we take with us when we uh, travel to hand out to people. This slide's a little out of date. We're about a 104 countries now. Uh, and 15 cruises. Uh, and there's a list of the places we've been on the cru cruises. And this one is going to reflect the, the travel there on the third one down, South America and Antarctica. Next slide, please. I always throw this one in whenever I give a travel presentation. These are four places that are, uh, that are some of our favorites. Uh, people ask us, what our favorites are, and it's really probably the last place we've been, is is what we always probably come up with. Uh, you may or may not recognize these. Of course, Machu Picchu, you probably do. Uh, the Blue Mosque is in uh, Istanbul, the Atacama Desert in Chile, and many of you may or may not recognize the one in the upper left, and that's Guilin, uh, China. Next slide, please. Today we're gonna to talk about Antarctica. Uh, most people, as it turns out, haven't been in there. It's a little hard to get to. Uh, and what I wanna talk about just to start with is why Antarctica? And Jenny and I were on about our fourth cruise and we were cruising in the Arctic and, and Ola and I were talking a little bit ago, included in that cruise was, was uh, several stops in Norway. And it was a 30-day cruise on a small ship with about 600 people. And so we got to meet a lot of those folks. And, and of course, typical cruise conversation uh, at dinner is, where you been and what's your favorite place? And the interesting part of that cruise was 100% of the people said Antarctica. And that's a phenomenal uh, turnout. And as it turns out, the average number of cruises per person on that cruise ship was 25, uh, with some as high as 40. So we booked an Antarctica cruise on that ship while we were there to go. Next slide, please. Okay, now we decided we're gonna go, now what? So we started looking around. We, we, we thought we were probably gonna do a cruise uh, because that's how we'd learned about uh, going there and, and got the feedback from people that had already been. But we weren't sure which size ship and what kind of a cruise to go on. Uh, those all travel to Antarctica is governed by the Antarctic Treaty. And the cruise part of it has lots of restrictions on the ships. Uh, they have to be dual hauled. They have to be able to use light fuel. And that's not always the case with the big cruise liners and big cruise ships. And so you have to meet that. Usually it's only the smaller of the big ships that can do that. The other discussion Jenny and I had is to go ashore or not to go ashore uh, in Antarctica. Now, in, in Antarctica, is, as you may or may not remember, is the, the, the place that actually has soil and, and land underneath the ice and things where in the Arctic it does not. And the, the law or the rule according to the treaty is you can only go ashore if your parent vessel is smaller than 500 passengers. That cuts it way down. Uh, they can only be 100 passengers at a time 
disembarked in Antarctica, and the guide ratio has to be no uh, higher or lower, depending on how you want to say that, than one to 20. So you have to have one guide for every 20 people going ashore. Going ashore means you get in a Zodiac rubberized boat from the, the slightly larger boat and motor ashore. Uh, Jenny nixed that in the first two minutes. Uh, she wasn't gonna ride around in the Zodiac. Uh, so that ended the talk of small ships. You can visit by small ship and air, just to give you an idea, the normal debarkation point for the small ships, we're talking 200, 250, I have some pictures of those uh, in the presentation. That's the typical size of going to Antarctica. Uh, both the air flights where you go and land out there and just spend a day or actually camp overnight for a couple days, those leave from Ushuaia at the very tip of South America. A typical cruise uh, is eight days uh, from Ushuaia to return. Of course, one day going and a little over one day going and coming because those ships are pretty slow. So actually about five days in Antarctica and the cheapest ones are about $11,000 a person. So it's very expensive to get there on the small ships. By air, $11,000 for two days. So money and time helped make that decision for us. And we said, okay, big ship sounds good to us. Next slide, please, Dick. This is the ship we went on, Holland America. We've done a lot of cruising with them. A uh, little older uh, demographics on uh, Holland America. The average age of the persons uh, on our cruise was 72. Average, so, uh, but very, very active uh, group. Uh, this ship has about 1,280 passengers, so no shore excursions, but as it turns out, at least in my opinion, you don't miss much at all by not going ashore in Antarctica. Here's the itinerary uh, from the cruise line that, that was posted. It, the cruise itself uh, started in Buenos Aires, uh, goes to Montevideo, Uruguay, then uh, Puerto Madryn, Argentina, and on down. Uh, stop in the Stanley Island or in the Falkland Islands at Stanley, uh, and then crossing the Drake Passage. Uh, we spent four days cruising in the peninsula of Antarctica, and then back to Ushuaia, and then on up the western coast of South America. So that's the the itinerary, so actually four days uh, in Antarctica on this particular trip. Next slide, please. For those of you who haven't been on a cruise or a big ship cruise, this is a typical stateroom on uh, Holland America ships. Pretty nice digs. Next cruise, please. Our next uh, slide, please. Yeah. Our, our motto is we try to take advantage of everything that's possible to do whenever we go anywhere. So we got to uh, Buenos Aires about a week early for this cruise uh, because we're taking another uh, three-day excursion that I'll talk about next, and that's why a week early. We tried to see and do as many things as possible. Uh, in Buenos Aires, a really easy city to get around in, especially if you do a little Spanish. Uh, public transportation is really good. Uh, Ginny and I took tango lessons, uh, as shown in the one slide there, and, and uh, saw some performances, saw the opera, and did uh, walked our feet to stumps, uh, walking around the rest of Buenos Aires. Really uh, uh, excellent city to visit, very easy for people who speak English. Next slide. We took a side trip, uh, and I'm gonna talk about that. It doesn't have anything to do with Antarctica, but if you ever get a chance to do this, this is probably our number one single most scenic place we've ever been on all of our travels. And that's uh, Iguazu Falls. It's on the Argentine-Brazil uh, border, and uh, at the time we went, you actually, to go to the Brazilian side, you had to have a uh, Brazilian visa. So that made it a not inexpensive trip because we wanted to go both sides. 
So it took us two months to end up getting the visa. I had to go in, per in person, get interviewed. Uh, it's good for 10 years, but we have that. Uh, and so we flew up. It's about an hour and a half flight, hour 45 from Buenos Aires uh, up to Iguazu Falls. Excellent. Uh, I'm only putting in uh, four in, of the uh, probably 500 pictures that I took uh, at Iguazu Falls. This is one small section of the falls here. There are 700 separate waterfalls in the configuration. Uh, you can walk a lot of it and it's totally different appearing from both sides of the border. From the, so if you ever think about going, go to the Brazilian side too. Uh, now they've done away with that uh, visa requirement last year, so now it's a lot easier uh, to do. So you sure, you wanna go to the Brazilian side. We spent uh, three days on the trip, two full days uh, touring this, and the weather, as you can see in this, was absolutely gorgeous and a phenomenal place. Next slide. Slightly different uh, view angle from all these falls are totally different than the ones uh, that were in the last picture. It's, and this one is uh, actually standing on a viewpoint for one of the sets of falls looking back up the river valley. And it just happened to be, you can kind of see the uh, rainbow there in the lower third of the picture. Uh, because of all of the mist in the air, we're standing next to a waterfall taking this picture. And then we walked down the hill. And if you look at that where, right where the rainbow is, that's a walking bridge where you can walk all the way across the river between the sides. And so we did that. We did the walk out across there and uh, in the thing. But just a, a totally spectacular place. And... Uh, We've been really fortunate, to, again, talking to all these uh, multi-cruise, multi-trip travelers, they said, ah, oh, you gotta go see the big three, uh, Niagara Falls, Iguazu Falls, and Victoria Falls. And, uh, and so we managed, we finished that, those three last year when we went to Victoria Falls in, in Zimbabwe. So uh, fantastic stuff. This is the uh, first stop on the cruise. So you, you settle off and you cruise like uh, three minutes and you're in Montevideo, Uruguay because it's directly across the bay of the river uh, from Buenos Aires. So it's, it's absolutely a very short trip. I didn't put a lot of slides in here uh, about this, but just to give you an idea of the high points of things, the, one of the main things that you notice in Uruguay and also the rest of Argentina, uh, and even uh, Chile on the other side is probably the most popular drink, and everyone drinks it 20 hours a day, is the, in the upper left uh, slide there is called mate, M-A-T-E, and it's a form of herbal tea, and they drink it continuously, all day long. Everybody's carrying some customized version of a cup that looks like that. And, when they, and then the other thing, Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, they love their meat. And this is uh, actually, this is in Uruguay, but everybody uses the Argentine word paria. That's what this is. This is in an open market, and there were 10 of these little shops like this uh, in the market. And you just go in because we no way, and even if you know some Spanish, you know the words for all these, but you point your finger and just have a great time. So, next day. This is the next stop on the cruise on the way to the Antarctic, and this is Puerto Madryn, Argentina. And we took a an excursion, uh, about an hour and 45 minute bus ride down the coastline to Punto Tombo, which is uh, a national park. And, uh, and it's a national park because it has the world's largest and highest concentration of sea lions. And now you're not allowed to go down and walk amongst them uh, down there. Those rocks that in the lower left-hand picture, if you see the jagged, the big kind of pile of rocks, uh, that's the closest you can get 
uh, on the ground. You do get to take little bo rubberized boats and go up and down the shoreline when you visit, uh, but that's rough water uh, out in there too, but a phenomenal uh, number of sea lions and, and worth, worth the visit. Next slide. This uh, little story about the Falklands Islands, uh, that was one of the places we really look forward to. For many of you know, I was in the military and I taught at the Naval War College. And, and one of the uh, conflicts that we talked about a lot in the Naval War College was the Falkland Islands War, or the Malvinas War, as the, as the Argentines call it. So I was really interested to go there and see the, quote, battlefields and the terrain and the places that I would talk about uh, during the things, uh, during the course of instruction. Uh, another interesting sidelight to me on this is a lady on our cruise, uh, this was her fifth try to get to the Falkland Islands. She had been on every one of them in Antarctica cruise, uh, and the four previous ones, she had not been able to get ashore at the Falklands. And the reasoning, the reason for that is the, the harbor is very shallow and not well protected at all for the winds. And so if you get winds, uh, anything like 15 miles an hour, you can't go ashore and things. We were lucky. Uh, we almost didn't get back to the ship because the wind came up while we were ashore. It was absolutely calm when we went ashore. Uh, a little bit tricky getting back, uh, but kind of worth it. Um, and the reason you go to Falkland Islands, uh, if you're not a military person, uh, is penguins. And we'll talk about that next. Uh, this is a shot we just walked. This is after we did our excursion to the penguins. Uh, this is the Episcopal Church in town, and that's a whale bone arch outside. This used to be a huge whaling capital back when that was the major form of fundraising uh, down in this part of the world, and those are pretty impressive. Thing next day. This is on the way to Penguin Heaven. This is at the far north end of the island. It's a two and a half hour ride in a four by four, and I mean you are four by four and for two and a half hours to get out there. Uh, this white stuff you see is not sand, it's penguin poop. And it covers everything at the north end of the island. So one of the first things you do when you get there is you get your industrial grade booties on and put them on over your shoes and get ready to stroll around out there. The uh, remarkable, of course it was nice and dry the day we were there, but absolutely no smell, none whatsoever associated with this. So it's kind of interesting from that. Uh, lots of nesting areas. The penguins are, you know, they don't get many visitors. There's probably uh, 10 or 15 cruise ships a year make it in, if that, into the Falklands, uh, usually less. And so these, and it's a really a hump to get out here where these penguins are. There's about a million of them in this area that we're in. So they're not afraid of people at all. They, they're more than happy and they're really curious. Uh, the biggest problem is the people don't behave well. And you know, you're, anybody who's traveled much knows that's true all the time. And so there's lots of areas that are posted, particularly the, the breeding grounds, uh, nesting areas, and those are off limits. And so these, these signs like this were posted uh, all over the place. In our group, there were, uh, oh, I'm going to guess uh, 60 or 70 total, and you know, you'll see a picture later, a whole bunch of four by fours, uh, and everybody did a good job of following the rules. Do the penguins speak? No, no. Oh, no. the people. Uh, I'm going to guess four. Uh, each, this is not a ship's tour, the ship doesn't go out here to this place. It's a private ranch, uh, but they allow local guides to take people out. So you book this trip through a local guide. We happened to book through a guy who had 50 friends, each one of his friends, they had 15 uh, four by fours in our group. And 
he was a really, really a good guy and a, and a good guide. I know that there were German and Spanish uh, groups, small ones, and, and then, of course, I don't know. I suspect there was probably a, another one uh, in there. Okay. Uh, let's stop here. This is a, there's several kinds of penguins that you see walking around. We did not see emperor penguins. In this part of the Falklands, there are no emperor penguins. Those are the largest ones. Uh, though the closest place to where we were was uh, South Georgia Island. And that's full of emperor penguins, but we didn't see any uh, at this part. But thousands of these king penguins, and you'll get a better idea how, bigger, how big these are in a minute. This is one of the best pictures I ever got of anything, uh, I think. And this is a pair of king king penguins that we just spotted walking around uh, the area. This is Jenny's new best friend. And it looks like Jenny is following the penguin. That's not true. We stopped here so that I could take a picture of the penguin following her. She was walking around, and this penguin followed her around for 15 minutes. About, about this far away each time, and no idea why, never got any closer, uh, never did anything, but I, we walked all over this area out here, and he or she was with us the whole time, so kind of neat. This is a king penguin, and, and this is a Magellanic penguin next to it there, so it gives you some size. Uh, ideas here, and the Magellanic uh, penguins were uh, having chicks while we were there, and they live out in all this flat poop cover area here. They dig little burrows, and you can't really see them until you're right on top of them, the burrows. And we saw many of these burrows with little chicks inside them. Uh, we were off by about maybe a week uh, to have them emerging and walking around, but they were all inside, still inside the burrows, the little uh, Magellanic chicks. These are really cool. These are rockhopper uh, penguins, and they are really exotic. They are about a foot tall, so they're small, really pretty small, but pretty exotic looking. Really, really fun to see and and watch move around. Another shot here. Uh, who knows, you could spend all day hanging around with penguins and have, uh, have such a good time. This, uh, we were in Falkland Islands on Christmas Day 2011. So this picture, they actually had uh, the, the Brits, who, uh, of course, are still in charge of the Falkland Islands, they, they have a tradition in Britain of Christmas cake. And so all of these guides had champagne and Christmas cake for us out here at the end point. When we were out touring, after we were done touring, we pulled up and had champagne and Christmas cake. And then this was a photo that we used on our 2012 Christmas card that we send out. Thanks. This is the uh, Gentoo penguins, yet another variety, uh, somewhere in the middle between the Magellanic and the King penguin in size, but they had all kinds of young chicks around. Those chicks are about two months old, and they're little fur balls. They, have, they look like little plush balls of fur. <laughs> so, really fun. And they all mix together. No fighting, squabbling, any of that. Next. Uh, the king penguins, a lot of them were molting, so they'd stand out and say, we happen to have a pretty nice day, sunny, not much wind. And they were, some of them, a lot of the kings was... Hard to get a good picture because they were molting and they really looked scruffy. This is the, some of the best pictures, too. Of course, you had to be there, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, get the context. But 
the group in the background there with their uh, bellies toward your white are all coming back from fishing and from eating, running back in a group, just having a great time. And this group in the front has been working. This, this beach is probably 300 feet wide. And so they're working their way out and they're heading out to hit the water and go fishing. They say hello to each other on the way by. Next slide. And then these guys make it to the water, and this is the last dash. Once they get within about 50 feet of the water, it's down onto all fours and full speed ahead. And away they go. And in 10 seconds, they're gone, and you don't see them again. That's the group. That's the total group size. A little more than half of these were our particular group that we went with. So a lot of people out there uh, seem like. Interesting thing here, on the way back, we had to stop three times, unload five or six of our uh, cars, get out and push another car out of the mud. So we got back, several of us, totally covered in mud and things from getting these cars out of the mud on the way back to shore. Of course, we got to do a little celebration back at the ship, great day. This group here, our tradition was at every port, uh, it was the responsibility of every uh, couple or traveling companions to buy a bottle of wine they'd never had before, and then we'd get together and share it uh, after, the, after the trips. Really a great group. This interesting thing here, the, the two fellows on the right of that slide, uh, the closest there, it happens to be uh, a couple, and the fellow on the, on the far right with a sweater on his shoulders uh, is an internationally, not known by me, but an internationally known concert pianist. And he makes several million dollars a year playing the piano. And his partner in the dark blue sweater at this time, 2011, was the chief flight attendant for United Airlines. Uh, he didn't fly anymore. He was in charge of all the, the flight attendants. So interesting. This is the kind of people you meet on cruises. It's one of the really fun things about going. Okay, finally, all this lead up, we're going to get to, uh, well, we're not going to quite get there because we have a little more tale to tell on the way. But what we did on this trip is we uh, sailed across the Drake Passage, which is one of the most hazardous waterways in the world. Uh, one of the reasons that a lot of people don't go to Antarctica is because you have to cross the Drake Passage to get there. And it can be awful. Uh, and it takes 16 hours in a big cruise ship going across and the little ones 30 hours. The little ones going from Ushuaia there on the thing. So we go down. What we're going to do is we're going to cross from the Falkland Islands. We don't go to South Georgia that you see out there in the, in the far right-hand side of the slide. But we do go to the South Orkney Islands, Elephant Islands, these other uh, uh, Shetland Islands, and then these other red dots on the map here are research stations and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go about uh, talking about our actual travel through Antarctica. We had a pretty reasonable crossing going south only 25 foot waves. Yeah. Now amazingly enough they did not close the de walking decks going southbound. And so, stupid us, we are out there walking the deck in this it's a beautiful day. And you would go from 15 to 15. And it was, it was something. But, uh, yeah, that's, those are some waves. Uh, this is the first real thing we passed. Now, we talked about the audience. This is Elephant Island. And I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about the Shackleton expedition because we got a two-hour lecture on that on board the ship. He was a, a British explorer and got trapped in the, in the ice trying to make 
a, a cross Antarctica trip and the things. His, uh, he was got trapped in, this was sailing ship, 1914. Get trapped in, the, in some rough water and gets frozen in. Can't escape. The, the ice, as we all know around here, moves continually. So in about uh, three weeks, his ship was about the size of toothpicks. Had been completely destroyed and uh, ground up into pieces. So they were stuck on the ice floe for months. No rescue team, nobody knew where they were. This is no communications, anything like this. Finally, they decided they had to do something in the next, quote, spring time there. So they packed their things into some open boats and they hit the water. They went for seven days in open boats in this kind of water and they ended up they ended up on this island in the left picture, Elephant Island. There's nothing there. It's a barren rock. Uh, and they spent six more months on Elephant Island waiting to try to decide what to do. After that six months, they said, we can't do it. We've got to find somebody to rescue us. So five men, including Shackleton, went in one boat and they hit out on the water and they navigated, they're in a rowboat, they navigated in this kind of water, if you remember back to the slide from Elephant Island all the way to South Georgia Island. And it landed on the south edge of South Georgia Island, which of course is not inhabited. Now they're stuck on the south shore of South Georgia Island and Shackleton says, I'll go get help. So he takes off, loads up his pack, and walks 32 miles across the center of the island in 36 hours and reaches a rescue station, and the whole group is rescued. So, okay. I spent two weeks in Ushuaia and the surrounding visiting friends. Great city and beautiful. Went on a Penguin cruise. Oh, yeah, it's from Pam. And what else? Yes. Who said that incredible voyage? Yeah, the, uh, there's about 50 books out there. The, the one I've read is slightly different than that. It's, it's called The Endurance, Shackleton's Legendary Antarctic Expedition by Caroline Alexander. That's the one I've read. There's bunches of books out there. Uh, hers is a little newer, hundreds of photos. The interesting thing was they had a professional photographer with them taking photos on glass plates. That was the medium back then. And he managed, he had hermetically sealed cases, put these in, left them where they were stranded, and over three years later, they went back and got them, and they were okay. So it's an amazing, if you like adventure stories, that's one, the Shackleton Expedition, look that up, and it's amazing. This is the first real iceberg that we saw. And I've been on Alaska cruises, I've been on other places where they say, oh, look, an iceberg. Nope, those aren't icebergs. This is an iceberg. And I was walking around the ship, Jenny and I have a, a kind of tradition we do, try to do three miles a day on the ship. So I'm doing part of my three miles in the morning, come out of the stateroom, hook a left around the back end of the ship, and boom, this is off to the side of the ship about one mile away. So this iceberg is one mile away. It's at least one and a half times bigger than the ship above the water. And unbelievable, beautiful things. And then they're everywhere. So you start looking around, and now we're into this this is the Antarctic cruise that we're doing. This is what we see every day for three days outside the ship. Now, the other thing to remember about Antarctica, as opposed to the Arctic, 
Antarctica has dirt underneath the shell, uh, ice and things. And so it supports every kind of wildlife known to man. So there are seals, penguins, whales, orcas outside the ship all day long, every day. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, that's part of the underground portion of the, those are ice shelf icebergs and they break off and they look like this, or tabular. They're also called tabular icebergs. They're simply amazing and, and just uh, beautiful when you, when you see these. But the thing that, do, that I didn't take a lot of pictures of the wildlife, but uh, another thing that I'll say right now is, and our captain said this, he had made 25 trips to Antarctica, our captain. We had the best weather he'd ever seen in his 25 trips. It was like this every day, all day long. No wind, sunny skies, bright, bright uh, visibility. So it was amazing. And we would watch seals chase penguins and orcas chase seals. And this is going on every day. And of course, the sunlight is nearly, 20, this is like the reverse of the Arctic. Yeah. Sunlight, nearly 20 hours a day. One more there. Next thing. More icebergs every day outside outside the window. You got to remember that those icebergs are all about the size of the ship. This was a really. This is where you wish that you were going ashore, because this is an ice cave that probably goes a mile back into the side of that glacier. Things just simply amazing. You you really did want to go see some things. Next, this is the other impression, and you're going to see several of these. I probably took 200 photos of stuff like this because absolutely calm, not a breath of air, bright sunlight, and every reflection is like it's from a mirror. And so the the beauty of these pictures and the setting that you're in is just phenomenal. Next step. Ice shelf glacier, next. This is an Argentine research station, the Esperanza. Uh, we saw oh four or five different research stations along the shoreline as we're as we're going on. Uh, very picturesque in, uh, in its own right. There and uh, lots of different countries have research stations uh, here in uh, mostly ecological, most because of the wildlife, not because of the of the uh, of the environment. Next. Step. This is the same research station. You can't hardly see it, but the kind of the lower left third center, you know, there's a little dot of red on the slide. That's the tallest building on the research station. It's on the back side of that gray hill. And that gray hill is what? Penguin poop. Okay. Millions and millions of penguins. Next day. This is. Another view, see the glacier in the background there? That's a glacier. That's not an Alaska glacier. That's a glacier there. That's the, and then this is the, the edge of that research station. And then if you look at the uh, kind of center part of the lower third of the slide, you see these little dots and things. Those are probably a couple thousand penguins. And, and right at the top of the ridge line, there up from the buildings, if you squint, you can see the two researchers that are sitting up there taking pictures of these penguins. That gives you an idea of the size and the scale that we're talking about. Now, the interesting thing here about this photo that it doesn't show is we sat here for an hour and watched the penguins climb out of the water and walk up that hill to those two places. To, now, you try that as a penguin. You know, getting out of that and walk up over that terrain to get into that nesting ground location. It's, it is an amazing physical event to watch them do that. This is another thing I didn't expect to see and along the shoreline. 
flamingos on the shoreline in Antarctica. Who knew? Yeah. Uh, depended on which side of the ship. No, it, the, the temperature was the same. It was 30 degrees Fahrenheit every day that we were there. And that's beautiful when the sun is brightly shining. And I'll show you a pic picture later if I mean that. Right, uh, was that the high or no? High. high, that was the high. It, actually, it's the temperature. <laughs> it's, the and the reason for that is, is you're surrounded by all that super cold water, uh, super chill, chilled water, that, and a lot of those icebergs and things are under so much pressure that they're actually colder uh, than 30 degrees, 32 degrees. So it just maintains the temperature. It doesn't go up and down. It just stays there that time of year. This is high summer. This is high summer in Antarctica, you know, January 1st or so. Is is where we there while while we were there. More scenery. It just it just you know I can't say enough about how amazing it is. Next. Next. I mean these look like they're made up. I took every one of these photos with not a fancy camera at all, just a regular, you know, auto shoot, point and shoot, point and shoot camera. Now this is an interesting shot here in the very lower part of this slide, you see a ship that you can sail on for $20,000 a person and come over here and spend two weeks. And it's a sailing ship, you sail over from Ushuaia. And you can, if you, it's kind of in the very bottom of the photo in the center, you can see the masts on the ship. And then behind the ship on the shoreline is a lighthouse on that little island that protects that bay. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's more adventuresome people than me. Next. What was the height of that iceberg? The mountain behind there? Oh, probably 8,000 feet. Okay, next. This is interesting. You saw this all the time. And this seal, seals love to take the vapors, you know, lay out in sunbathe on the top of these little ice flows. I had a video in here that I took out because it's, uh, you know, I told Dick, it's just kind of too hard to control in a Zoom meeting, the video. There were on an ice flow like this, not this one, but one that looked very much like this, only a little smaller. A friend of mine gave me a video of three orcas working the ice flow, trying to get that seal to fall in the water. And they were on three separate sides and they would hit it with their head, come up with their chin, knock it down, tip it up, and then get it rocking, get the momentum going. And then the one on the other end, when it came down, he would do the same thing. And they had this thing going for 15 minutes and that seal would slide to within one foot of the edge and not go in and they'd get up, but they couldn't get their mouth over the edge to get a hold of the seal. So they quit and it was amazing. They spent 20 minutes trying to get this one seal and didn't get it. But there were three of them working together to, to try to make it happen. Next slide. That's just a close up uh, of the same seal. Next. Next. This is uh, <laughs> one of the less expensive. That's one of the eleven thousand dollar ships. If you look down in a, you know, right in the middle of the frame, you can see the blue hull, kind of a a little more brighter blue color. This is a two hundred person ship. Sails out of Ushuaia. You get to spend five days. That's a research station. Uh, I'm not sure which country. Not ours. Uh, in the background there, and they. Uh, of course, the smaller ships, then they put people ashore and they get to do things. Next slide. And this, from this, here's a little bit uh, closer view of that ship with the research station. And these are kayakers off that ship. And they have a, a ramp at the back of the ship that they can lower down. And they put their kayak on the ramp, get in and slide into this water. And they're kayaking out and watching the orcas eat the seals. 
And so, and I'm not sure that that's my idea of a good time uh, to be out in that frigid uh, water with an orca eating a seal right next to you, because I'm not sure how good that orca's eyesight is. You know? So uh, this is, I'm gonna give you a couple minutes on this. This is the only photo I have of these guys and guys and gals. Uh, and we had two uh, boat loads of these uh, Zodiac loads of these people come aboard and they're from Palmer Station, which is a US uh, research station in Antarctica. It was built in uh, like 1968. There's, we're there in high summer, so there's about 40 people, all scientists, uh, at the station in the summer. And then that drops down to about 10 in the winter because it's a nasty place uh, in the winter. They were on board. They got there about eight o'clock in the morning. They spent all day, they, eat, they ate five meals uh, while they were there because, you know, the kind of food we had on the ship was not what they were getting uh, to eat uh, at the research station. And then they left and before that, you can't really see it in this slide, but the guy coming down the rope ladder there is carrying a 50 pound bag of grapefruit. And so they took bags of grapefruit and oranges and, you know, perishable things that they just don't ever get. And that was their pay uh, for going. They gave uh, continuous lectures all day long. And they're about what goes on at Palmer Station. Next slide. And yes, this is my temperature slide. Uh, perfectly comfortable outside in just a long sleeve shirt out there. Absolutely, totally comfortable unless you walked into the shade. And then you wanted your cat and your coat and your gloves. As soon as you, as soon as you walked into the shade, you wanted your hat, your coat, and your gloves. But if you were in the sun, it was awesome, Nixon. Okay, now we get to go back to Ushuaia. That's the end of Antarctica. That's three days worth of compressed slides. We only thought we saw waves coming down. On the way going back, we had a full force 10 gale blew across. They put steel uh, hurricane shutters on all the windows, except on all the windows that are low in the lower two levels of the ship, except ours. Ours was the absolute center cabin on the lowest level and we book that intentionally because of the Drake Passage because it minimizes the moment on the rock and roll when you're in the middle of the ship. You don't get near the impact of the rock and roll and when you're in the down low and in the middle of the ship. So we, we could have made a thousand dollars selling tickets to our room for people to watch these waves during the crossing back again. Right now they did lock everything down. Everything. You, there were dining rooms that were not open. Nothing was open. You could go get a sack lunch at the dining room and take it back to your room, but not allowed to be out walking around doing anything, being anywhere. Uh, these would cover half of the front deck. When the nose would come down, they would come all the way up and hit the front windows of the dining room, the, the waves. So, no, the... Uh, and I'm not sure. Actually, I think big waves and things like this are easier for seasickness because they're not a constant movement and you don't, you know, you're, they're kind of abrupt. And so they don't end, and, but I'm not, you know, I'm a pilot, so I'm not susceptible really too much to that anyway. And if you use the same techniques as a pilot, which is don't pay any attention to your senses, use your eyes. So you have to use your eyes and keep them moving around and, and don't lay down. You know, the big problem is people who get seasick lay down. Worst thing you can possibly do is lay down and uh, it'll do it. But we had probably 25, 30% of the people on board were not having a good time uh, during this. But there were a lot of them who were really scared too. They were, and, but we didn't have any damage to the ship. Uh, and it's one of those things with, when it's over, you're glad you did it because it makes a great story, but you'd never do it again. You know? Yeah, no, that's right. But uh, that's the, that's the thing with this is, uh, 
it's, it, it was really beautiful when it was happening. Next. Okay, so uh, we didn't get destroyed. We're pulling into Ushuaia. Pam talked about that. Really kind of a cool place. There's a huge uh, national park at the very, very end of the South America there to Ushuaia. That's just fascinating um, to walk around. But most of us were glad to be, after the crossing, we're glad to be back uh, in port. Next slide. So that's pretty much wraps up uh, Antarctica. You can see that uh, it's, it's all about the scenery and the wildlife. When you go there, it's a very difficult place to get to. Uh, it is a place that Jenny and I would go back. Uh, we don't have very many places on our list where we said we would go back again. Uh, this is one of them. This is one where we would go back uh, to do this, though, you have to be uh, mesmerized by uh, beauty and things. If sitting and watching these things happen doesn't do it for you, then this is not the trip uh, because there's no activities. You don't get off the ship. You don't do anything. It's all about just taking in the natural, the, the natural beauty that's around you and uh, does the thing. But well worth it. Any questions? Feel free to unmute your microphone, ask questions, or type something into the chat box. Questions rolling. Could you see or hear about this group? Oh no, I didn't. I haven't heard that. If you look in the chat box, there's a question from Olin Joynton about the voyage of uh, the Beagle, which is was the ship Charles Darwin uh, was on. Oh, I think he's talking about taking some of the natives back. Right. Yeah, no, I did. I have read about that, uh, about taking the natives back. And, and they were, uh, they being the people on the Beagle were really impressed with the culture and the knowledge that these people had, but they didn't wear clothing, uh, as was kind of common in the uh, Caribbean areas or in the, in the South Sea Island areas. And so, yes, I do remember. I do remember reading about that, and and, uh, and actually, one of them uh, became a British c uh, citizen and became very well known throughout, and did dress up in all the British finery of the time and uh, do that. Yes, I think his name was uh, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I think that's right. They yeah. Were, uh, um, without any clothes, in the raging wind and driving rain and probably 35 degree weather all the time. I think they survived on seaweed and mussels. And yeah, it's, when you think back in like the Shackleton uh, expedition and not only his, but there's a hundred stories like that of these explorers, the, the trials that they went through, we can't even imagine right. today what it's like, what, uh, what it was like for them to uh, to do the very basic things that they did and, and how physically and mentally tough they were right. uh, in order. And they, and they wanted to do this. That's the, you know, okay, I think I'll go do this. Oh, yeah, okay. You know, so it's a, it, it is simply amazing, uh, their capabilities. Any other questions for Rocky? Or comments? Uh, just as a point of interest for the, I don't know what this cruise costs now. Uh, I think it's in the uh, $3,500 to $4,000 per person uh, area for 20 days. Uh, it was much cheaper than that when we did it. But I think that's right about now. It's, you're looking at about $4,000. What do they 
Uh, where? Oh, there's, there's everywhere you look, there's stuff to eat, if you're willing to eat it. The, uh, for instance, Shackleton's, they were trapped in the ice, but they were only, uh, you know, a mile or so from the water or less by the time they got trapped in the ice. And the amount of, of wildlife in the water, now fish and birds and seals and penguins and all these things, they're everywhere. Everywhere we were, there was all this wildlife. I can't imagine they didn't have a way to capture net things, these things, the fish, the penguins, the birds, the, you know, there wasn't any uh, fruits or vegetables. No, no, they had a capability to start fires. They could burn the ship. No, I mean, it's a wooden ship. Uh, they, they did have a capability to have some fire and get some warmth and and uh, yeah, they're, they weren't uh, totally out of, uh, you know, they weren't naked and alone and just dumped there. They, they had some resources they could use. And, you know, I've taken probably five or six survival courses for all various parts of the world, including the Arctic, uh, which is much different than Antarctica. In the Arctic, you don't have all those things to eat. Uh, in, in Antarctica, it's a it's a wonderland of things to eat, and if you don't mind eating moss, and yeah, I mean it's good for you, and and things and so all those and lichens, all those things that you see that are orange and green and that color the rocks, that's all edible. There's a question from Pam about can you show us on the map where Shackleton was stuck? Yes, uh, I think. It's right. Yeah, right. Is that Elephant Island? It, I think it's Elephant Island, right? Right. It's right about there. He was actually stuck on the mainland, down, down to the right there. Uh, okay, I'm going to point on this map, and then you can do it on yours, Dick. I'm going to leave the thing, but I think right. That's Elephant Island, right where you're at here. It's, it's right here. Is Elephant Island? He actually came, his ship is right here. Oh, down by the, Down by... Down by the... Yeah, right here. That's where the ship is in, was... Because uh, he was trying to go across the center part of the, of the uh, thing, and, and that's where they came out. So they were, right about there is where the ship down, broke up. Down by the... Yeah, uh, and then they went from the there by their lifeboats, to yeah. Elephant Island, to Elephant which is right there. And then he managed to get over. And then they went over to South Georgia. That's 720 miles. So, and, you know, rudimentary navigation capability and equipment. Open, open. totally open boat. That's part of the Drake Passage. I mean, imagine what that was like trying to do that. Yes, were those boats sailing ships or were they rowing? No, they were rowing. Yeah, these are these are tough guys. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions, comments for uh, Rocky? I think we covered everybody's questions on chat, comments. Okay, with that. Uh, We'll be uh, signing off. We appreciate uh, Rocky's uh, sharing his adventure in the uh, Antarctica. Sounds uh, interesting. Hopefully sometime in the future we can get back to traveling and see some of these places. So with that, uh, we'll be uh, ending the presentation. Thank you all for uh, attending, and thanks, Rocky, for presenting to us again. Thank you. Bye.